So just to set some context for you, for the last, I think, 120 years, Honeywell has been the ultimate industrial powerhouse. But in today's world, apparently being bigger isn't always better. Because earlier this month, Honeywell announced plans that it would be the latest American conglomerate to break itself apart and split into three separate companies. The timing here is interesting. Uh, just a few months ago, we saw the activist investor, Elliott Management, taking a $5 billion stake in Honeywell, calling for change. Now Elliott basically has what it wanted. So what is next for the company and what does it mean for its presence here in the Middle East, a region that is, of course, investing heavily in automation, aerospace, and AI. So Vimo, let's drive, dive straight into the conversation here. You know, some analysts say the benefits of this breakup are going to take time to materialize. So why should investors believe this is the right move? So, uh, you know, if you look at a company like us, uh, we, we serve three broad sectors, uh, aviation, energy, and infrastructure. And uh, over the last, I started my job about 18 months back. And the the priorities between what we do in Honeywell in automation and energy was getting more and more separated from what we do in aerospace. So uh, we decided with the board almost a year back that we should transition to a new state uh, to being two separate companies because it allows us to grow in each one independently from position of strength versus from uh, position of weakness. And uh, Iliad's arrival essentially made us communicate our decision a little bit ahead of time. Essentially, this is what we always plan to do it. And uh, on their arrival, we, we felt it's important to communicate what we want to do to broader shareholders. So I believe it's going to be good for our customers. You know, your question specifically for UAE, we have a big presence in the country for in uh, energy sector, in infrastructure, and in uh, aerospace. So we believe nothing is going to change. I mean, I think the, good, the way to think about it is two Honeywells are better than one Honeywell. And we're going to have Honeywell what, as it exists today and Honeywell Aerospace, which will get created over the next 18 to 24 months. So let's talk about what it means for the region, because this is a part of the world that is rapidly transforming. You'll hear a lot today about AI, automation, aerospace, all central to Vision 2030 in Saudi Arabia, and of course, what the UAE is doing as well. In Saudi, they're making big bets on aerospace and defense. The UAE is, of course, really leading in automation and specifically in artificial intelligence. So how does this breakup change Honeywell's approach to the region, and what type of business would you like to do here? So the good news is we are deeply present in, in this region for 25, 30 years. So this is not a new gig for us. Strong presence in UAE, strong presence in Saudi and other parts of the GCC countries. I would say this is going to make our presence deeper in each segment because when we are separated as two companies, we're able to focus far more deeply into each segment. And uh, our capital investments, our R&D investments are more focused compared to what it was in the past because now we have more flexibility to do it in each, each organization. And I wish from the region perspective, I would uh, believe that we'll have more capability in uh, adoption of AI in industrial sector. Uh, we have a large install base here in uh, oil and gas sector. We have a large install base here for all building infrastructure. And how do we bring new technology in context of what's coming in and make things more productive? That's going to be an opportunity for all of us. I don't think it's lost on anyone here that AI-driven automation is really reshaping and transforming industries. So how do you see it reshaping industrial manufacturing, particularly in the Gulf? So, you know, this is something which I would say is an emerging area and very fascinating. If you see a company like us, we have been collecting data for a very long time. Uh, a typical automation system essentially senses something and acts on it. And the, 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 the whole process is very deterministic. It always acts the same, precisely the same way. It doesn't change so, so what's missing is we are not using the data in this closed loop system to think. And we're going to add the think layer in addition to the sense and act layer. And it just makes the whole things more smarter. The question is, what's, what will be the use case of it? How will it really work? I always give an example that uh, someone like me, you know, I've changed many cities. So I'm a good driver, but I'm not a good navigator. So using Google Maps is an AI tool for me to make me effective because I can drive effortlessly because it tells me what to do. 
So in context of industrial sector, more and more tools are going to come, more and more agents are going to come by which our systems can be used, operated, maintained much more easily, which means that uh, we could run with lower skills, we could less with uh, lesser skills, and the skill shortage issue, which is becoming very prominent, this is going to be the antidote for that. Mm. So we are excited about uh, where we are headed with that, and a lot of new offerings are coming in the market uh, with, with AI embedded in. Of course, energy is not everything, but it's quite critical mm -hmm. to our part of the world. How do you see it transforming things like the energy transition, and in particular, energy security? So what we have learned over the last uh, two or three years is that uh, every country is developing its energy strategy based upon three criteria: uh, economics, security, and emissions. So answer changes which countries uh, you know, in front of you. And we provide technologies, which is traditional energy, be it refining uh, gas or renewable technologies like hydrogen or sustainable aviation fuel. And the adoption rates depends on which part of the world you are, because you're trying to solve this three-part equation. Uh, everybody wants to care about energy security. That's probably moving to the highest priority. Then economics, and then emissions. And I think it's ideal world you should be able to solve all of them. Uh, but we have seen priorities changing and shifting based upon how people uh, you know, prioritize uh, over the last two or three years in particular. And security has overtaken everything else, uh, in my view. You wrote recently that we are at an inflection point in industry. You said, I'm optimistic 2025 is the year we truly begin to move at scale to industrial autonomy, where every day is your best day of operation and every person is a world-leading export. It's really fascinating. So think about it this way, that the systems what we provide, they are used by humans. And a plane is run by a pilot, a plant is run by an operator, and building is maintained by a technician. They have a varying degree of skills. Therefore, performance of equipment machine really depends upon a human who's running it. With, with AI coming in, uh, we are moving from automation to autonomy. It means we are enabling humans to perform at a consistent level all the time. It means every day will be your best day, versus your best day is dependent on a particular human who knew the best practice based on an experience. So we're going to supplement experienced people with, with, the, with this set of tools. And I, I, you know, the way I would always explain is that uh, human judgment has to go at, at a higher level using these tools. It doesn't mean there's always a dialogue around that AI is a substitution to human, definitely not in an industrial world we operate in. It's going to be taking human tasks away, which are repetitive, and humans have to make judgment and decision based upon higher level of task because we can do a lot of pattern recognition using large language models and eliminate those repetitive tasks. You mentioned AI uh, and human substitution. So the goal here, the end goal for a conglomerate like yours would be, how do we ensure that AI becomes a tool rather than uh, yeah. something that's ultimately going to replace the, the people power needed to power this? Absolutely. Yeah. You, know, uh, you know, I'll give another example. Uh, our products tend to require a deep level of uh, technical support. So we have thousands of people in our organization which provide uh, our customers how to use our product. And those capabilities can be built into our products now because you could talk to, ch chat with the product and it'll tell you the maintenance procedure. So what's exciting is what's coming ahead, it's going to be different, more capable solutions, more capable products. And therefore, I always remind you of moving from a typical system to autonomous. Autonomous doesn't mean it won't really need humans. It means that it's easier to use these technologies uh, compared to what it was in the past. So much progress has already been made in the use of AI and mm. the development of this industry, particularly from a, a financial and investment perspective. When you look at the progress that's been made so far, what is the single most transformative innovation that will define the future of aviation, industrials, and energy as a result of the impact of AI? So I would say, uh, I think if you leave each of these sectors, moving towards autonomy is a one single constant change essentially defining what autonomy means. Uh, think of a plane, and can we run a plane with one pilot uh, or without pilot? Uh, 
Do but, we want to? <laughs> yeah. So definition of autonomy would be that how do we really enable the current set of people to be more productive and more efficient? So it's the layers of transformation really have to occur. So I would say think about uh, oil and gas industry, think about infrastructure industry or aerospace sectors we serve. Uh, autonomous operations will be the new uh, move over the next several years. In addition, I would say uh, definitely in aerospace, electrification is a big uh, rate of change. Uh, we do expect more and more electrification adoption because it makes the uh, aeroplanes more efficient. Uh, and uh, in energy sector, we expect more and more molecules to become more uh, viable, you know, uh, so that we could use more, uh, um, like think about, say, hydrogen. Hydrogen adoption can increase if technology becomes more feasible and more economic. So I think those are the changes which are likely to occur, that new molecules which are more feasible, electrification in aerospace, and autonomy, I see those are some of the things which we are working on. Talk to me about the quantum computing strategy as well, because I know you've also said you want to uh, attempt to monetize the stake in Quantinium. This is Honeywell's quantum computing subsidiary as well. Just expand on that. So, uh, you know, we, we, I learned uh, to talk from CPUs to GPUs over the last one year. I think now we have to learn how to talk about QPUs, which is a quantum processing unit. The, the measure of quantum is the qubits. And it, at a, when a quantum computer reaches about 100 qubits, then it can perform tasks which a classical computer cannot perform. So that's a magic number, uh, 100 qubits. And we expect that uh, Honeywell has a venture called Quantinuum. It will have a hardware machine which will ach achieve that milestone by end of 26, early 27. So what it will mean is that the tasks, so the question will be then what task will be possible? So think about drug discovery where uh, we, are, we are already practicing AI models, but the data set is not sufficient enough to train the AI models. But quantum can overcome that limitation because it has capabilities which traditional compute machines don't have. So we expect anything to do with the molecule discovery, drug discovery, uh, where quantum computers will be useful. So I'm very hopeful that in about three years' time, the way we are very knowledgeable and talk about GPUs, we're likely going to have more and more conversation about uh, you know, a quantum compute. And we do expect uh, you know, uh, this company to go public in that time frame because we'll have revenue streams around that. OK, so looking to take it public. Just before we uh, depart, I, I wanted to ask you about some of the risks as well. Because when you think about the impact of quant, when you think about the progress that's been made in AI so far, this is not a risk-free technology, right? Mm -hmm. So what sits on top of your risk list when you assess the impact of AI on businesses like yours and industries like the ones that you're responsible for developing? I would say for us is, uh, more than risk, for us is ability to identify the best use cases which will create the highest value. We can consume a lot of time on doing things which are interesting, but really doesn't provide enough returns. So really focusing on what will be the best scenario to solve for which creates value, uh, that to me is the biggest opportunity or biggest challenge for us to con confront in front of us. Any advice for C-suite leaders, for government officials in the room when it comes to incorporating some of this technology into their own use cases? I always talk about uh, the biggest advice I'll give is immersive learning. We all have to practice AI ourselves, use the tools so that we can appreciate how to apply it more broadly in our organization. Unless we, don't, we are not learning, because it's very different compared to anything else we have used, so I do practice myself. I try to learn as much as I can. And I think that's the best way to appreciate uh, where these technologies could be headed moving forward. I think we're just getting started as well. So, Vimal, I wish we had more time, but we'll have to leave it there. Thank you so much for Thank joining us on stage here at the World Government here. Summit. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, that. please Thank make you. you feel welcome.